Grace, mercy, and peace belong to you. They are free gifts from the one who was and is and is to come. Amen. Sometimes the Bible can be a roadblock to faith. Let that sink in for a moment. Can the Bible, which we claim to revere and hold sacred, be an impediment to believing? Can the Bible get in the way or keep us from getting close to God? I think the answer is yes. Mostly, though, it's not what Scripture says that hinders our faith. It's the attitude we bring into our reading that is often the problem. John Dominic Crossan, a noted Jesus scholar, says it's not that the ancient people, and I'm quoting now, it's not that the ancient people told literal stories and we are now smart enough to take them symbolically. But it's that they told them symbolically and we are now dumb enough to take them literally. Harsh words? Perhaps. But I think his point is that we have become so literal minded that we close down our imaginations and go into scripture only looking for justification for what we already believe. Many, I think, would be a lot happier if the Bible were more like a Ouija board. Especially in this country, we tend to treat the good book as this kind of simplistic moral code. Do this, don't do that. A rule book designed to save us from eternal damnation. But when we seek those absolute answers, should I or shouldn't I, or how do I, or what did I ever do to deserve this, we're confused. We're confused by passages that seem to contradict others, and so we toss the whole thing aside as illogical, impossible to understand, and thus consequently of little use for today's problem du jour. A seminary colleague of mine, now an Episcopal priest, was fond of saying, we just can't stand uncertainty and not knowing. When two statements stand in opposition to one another, our black and white minds want to force one point of view to be wrong. Which is it? Both can't be right. But as the old song from the 40s used to say, it ain't necessarily so. Take the 10th chapter of Matthew's Gospel as a case in point. In that passage that I just read, I bet more than a few of your internal alarm bells went off. Didn't we just hear the so-called Prince of Peace saying he's come to bring a sword? Doesn't that make Jesus at best some sort of warmonger? Or at the very least, a hypocrite? What happened to my peace? I leave you. And even worse, didn't we just hear this selfish Savior calling us to reject our children or leave our husbands and wives, all to follow him because nothing else and no one else matters? What kind of family values are those? You know, at times reading the Bible can be a lot like watching advertising on television. 
when we hear something that sounds too good to be true, chances are it is. In the same way, but in, we, in reverse, when we hear a biblical passage that sounds so out of character for God, or so out of sync with the other teachings of Jesus, odds are it's the Holy Spirit challenging us to dig a little deeper in search of the real message. What's going on here? This can't be right. Did he really say that? God has blessed us with brains and he expects us to use them. In one sense, the things we hear in this passage are exactly what Matthew does have Jesus saying. But if we simply stop there, if we take the position that what we see and hear is what we get, if that's all we take away from this troublesome text, then we risk missing entirely, entirely what Jesus is saying about the true cost of discipleship, about loyalty and trust and obedience and our true place in the kingdom of God. The blunt and maybe surprising truth embedded in this text is that Jesus is indeed no champion of family values. At least not as we would like to define those values in this era of focus on the family, which puts everything family on some sort of idealized pedestal, often at the risk of making family a substitute religion in its own right. The rest of this embedded truth here is that if we listen carefully, we can hear Jesus championing, championing kingdom values. And those values often are not the same thing. In the first century, the family had primary importance in the Mediterranean world, but maybe more so than for economic reasons, <laughs> than the emotional ones that we would claim today. But family loyalty was the greatest and most passionate good nonetheless. And so what better way for Jesus to explain the true cost of discipleship than to compare what Jesus was asking people to do with what he knew people most valued in life, their families. The reason this passage and a similar one in the Gospel of Luke, which actually uses stronger words. I think Luke says, whoever ha hates your father and mother. The reason these are so hard to take is that they strike against what we hold most dear. I don't know of any parent today, or grandparent for that matter, who wouldn't sacrifice for a son or a daughter, especially if you're an aging baby boomer. Wasn't the mantra that we want our children to have it better than we did? And we all like to think we would make similar sacrifices for our husband or our wife or one of our parents, perhaps a sibling. After all, taking care of family is just what one does. But while there were Similarities in the ancient world with today. Family values back then could often take a different turn. In a world where the household unit was, for, was framed almost solely for economic reasons, economic necessity, rather than romantic notions of love and a desire to have children. Households were extended tribes of many people and leaving the bonded unit to follow the call of an itinerant preacher, an itinerant preacher who was so often at odds with the tradition of, of uh, Jewish temple synagogue worship, that would often mean financial disaster for those who are left behind and maybe even physical danger at the hands of the Roman oppressors. Oh, you're from so-and-so's family. We got our eye on you. 
Families back then faced pressures to reject Jesus and his claims in ways that are scarcely imaginable for us today. So when Jesus speaks of bringing a sword, he's not speaking literally, but more of the strong social consequences that can follow, the ostracization that can follow, the deprivation that can follow, from a decision to drop everything as Peter and Andrew did with their fishing nets, leaving their father alone in the boat, and not even knowing where they were headed. But we can't, we can't in this text stop at these kinds of yes or no decisions. For there is a twist and an important context to be missed if we merely focus on a few verses and not the larger message of the full gospel. It is fundamental, fundamental in reading the Bible that we look not only at the passage in question, this little narrow slice, but at the verses that come before and come after, sometimes reading the full chapter and occasionally, as I'm suggesting here, reading the entire book in this case, the Gospel of Matthew. Do all of that so that the light of the Holy Spirit can illumine our understanding. You know, like they always say in real estate, it's location, location, location. And in Bible interpretation, it's context, context, context. And when we do that, when we look at the larger context of what Matthew is trying to say, a clearer picture of what the Bible is saying about human relationships and the family values of Jesus begins to emerge. But to see that picture, we must first sever ourselves from the mindset that Jesus is asking us to choose. Your family or me? Which is it? We can draw that conclusion only by taking these few verses from chapter 10 out of context from the rest of the gospel. The rest of the gospel, if anything, is a tribute to human relationships. If we read Matthew 5, or Matthew 15, or Matthew 18, or Matthew 19, we will hear Jesus calling on people to honor and lift up their children, to honor their father and mother, and other family relationships. It's because there are two principles at work in the Gospel of Matthew. Two principles that show us not only Matthew's view of Jesus, but of family and personal relationships. The first principle is the more obvious one. That is, all of us, you and me, are made by God for God. Our life is not about us, but about the God who created us. And the second principle is that if we acknowledge God's mastery, God's mastery over our lives, we also acknowledge God's control over all our relationships. Which simply means our relationships are not really ours at all. According to Matthew's Gospel, God gives people to each other as a gift, a blessing. And he places us in relationship with each other and holds us accountable accountable for our conduct within these relationships. So we do not have relationships with others. We are stewards of our relationships that are given to us by God. When you think about it, most relationships, be they parental or, romant or romantic, that break apart most often than not, it's over issues of one person attempting to control the other. As if someone is ours to own. Now here's where 
here's where we connect the relationship dots between the love of God and the love of people in our lives. How we reconcile these admonitions to honor children and parents and spouses with equal weight commendations to subordinate them for Jesus' sake. The solution to the puzzle, which is it? It's found toward the end of the gospel. If you look in chapter 22, in Jesus' answer to the Pharisees who asked, Teacher, what is the greatest commandment? Remember what he said? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. The second commandment, he said, is like it. That is like the first commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The key phrasing here is when Jesus says the second commandment is like the first. He did not say love your neighbor instead of me as in that's an okay substitute. Nor did he say love me instead of your family or your neighbor. Far from being antithetical or even competitive, devotion to God and neighbor, and here read neighbor the same as family. Devotion to God and neighbor and family are defined as virtually synonymous. Loving and serving God first implies obedience to God's will. And according to Matthew, God's will is that we love and serve those around us. Thus, you get this blessed paradox. We are to love and serve only God. But since God tells us to love and serve others, we cannot fulfill the command to love and serve only God except by loving and serving others. The way to love God is by loving those we are given to love. Get it? It's a complicated little rubrics puzzle, but when you think about it, it's really pretty simple. I pray that you get it. For when we do, when we grasp that this not so terrible truth that we heard earlier, we use the two-edged sword of the living God to sever those habits of the small self those narrow, artificial limits that we place on ourselves and on our spirit. And we become reborn into the divine spaciousness of the great self of God, in whose image we have all been made, and in whose image we are all one. Shalom and Amen.